I don't need the microphone. Do I need the microphone? <laughs> I'll get one just in case. For you. <laughs> no, a boy should carry, but it doesn't. So yeah, they're please stick around for, for Death in Lavender because it's the world premiere. I'm going to talk to the fest to see if we can get another screening before night screens tomorrow. Um, we'll see if that happens or not, but I think probably we can pull that off. But please stick around for it. Uh, it'll be in just a few minutes. Yep, as soon as we get done with this. Uh, Lee, first, will you tell us about how this project came about? <coughs> well, I kind of said that before, that uh, you know, Dillis, Dillis and I aren't sure how old I was. I was either 17 or 18 when I first pitched him Darkness. I'd written Darkness when I was 17, but I thought I had seen Night Screams before I met him, and it wasn't released till January of uh, 1998, so I had to be 18 if we met then. But uh, like I said, he and I had just been friends all these years, and we got these video deals, and they knew, uh, since they were releasing my movie also, and um, they liked me, I guess, so they were just like, you know, and they, it, it just worked out because uh, I knew Dillis, I knew a lot of the stories about the making of the film, and uh, so they asked me to do the documentary. Excellent. I, I, I think it's important. I think it's, it's actually, uh, you know, the Night Screams was the first feature. Now, King Kung Fu had been in production, and it started in 1976, and then the post-production had stalled. But that was shot on 16 millimeter anamorphic, and, and it took a long time to get done. Uh, and it was still in post when Night Screams was finished. So Night Screams, uh, you know, the, was, as far as somebody from Wichita deciding I'm going to make a movie in Wichita, uh, and it was shot on 35 millimeter, it's, it's, it's a, it was an important milestone in the history of film cinema. So I, I was honored to, to, I thought it was a good story to tell and I wanted to be a part of it. No, but I thought it was excellent. Uh, how did you approach uh, directing the documentary versus when you did Darkness? Like, did, did you approach your... <laughs> Okay, Darkness, uh, again, it was supposed to be a proof of concept. So um, none of the actors had really any acting experience. They were recruited uh, from different sources, but um, on Darkness, I ran camera, I ran sound, I set up the generator, I set up the lights, and did a lot of special effects. On this movie, I had <laughs> Nathan, I mean, you can't see Nathan's, uh, but I, I had a great crew. I had. Uh, Tyler W. Moore, and that's the thing that's interesting also, the film, what you're going to watch here in a minute, promise, uh, Death, by, uh, Death in Lavender, um, we shared a lot of the same production crew, uh, and a lot of that happened because of Fritz. Uh, Fritz uh, is the producer of Death in Lavender, and Fritz is actually doing something I've always wanted to do, but haven't been able to, where he has been kind of a sponsor or a... a uh, a, you know, a patron of the arts and supporting a lot of local filmmaking. And uh, he has a group that he works with most, but I know he's been very you know, generous. He was with us. He loaned us the cameras that we used to shoot in Wichita. And Tyler and Nathan both ran camera. We had Caitlin, uh, say hi Caitlin. Caitlin was ran camera. Is Victoria here? Victoria Gare was on the set. We, had, we actually had, I had so much help that I just sat in a chair and told people what to do. So it was like making a real movie, man, you know? Um, the first time, you know, I, I actually did commercials here in town. Have you ever seen a Dops chiropractic commercial um, with a, a woman with a baby? Uh, raise your hand, Arrow. Stand up real quick. Look in the back real quick. This is my daughter. She's 15 now. <laughs> Dops chiropractic is so cheap, they're still using the same commercials all these years later. She's, she's <laughs> one years old in that commercial. Um, but I did a bunch of Dops chiropractics, and I did, uh, we did, I got a gig doing a, a paint, a spray paint that's invisible in regular light but glows under black light called clear neon. And that was the first time I ever had a crew um, where I could ask, a guy, I could trust people, you know, to run the camera. And uh, I, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience because I never, I never felt like I directed Darkness because it was just, uh, you know, it was a traffic cop at best, you know, just trying to, to do too way too much. Um, and I actually got uh, really drunk after that night. We all went out to party after the first night with filming Night of uh, Clear Neon. And I walked up to the, we're at this little, we're out in uh, Park City. And there's like, what looked like a biker bar, all cinder blocks and pretty rough kind of looking. But we were in there getting drunk. And I walked up to the bar and uh, there was a, another cat there. And he goes, and I just walked up and went straight to the bar. He goes, hey man, you're not going to cut in front of me, are you? I'm like, and I'm like, I'm like flying. I'm so happy. I'm, it's such a blast actually directing, man. 
So I'm like, oh no, sir, I wouldn't dream of such a thing. <laughs> you know? and, and he's like, he looked at me because he's really kind of like thinking about he might have to get into it with me. And he just looked at me, he's like, what's going on tonight, man? I said, you're not going to believe me if I told you. He goes, try me. I said, I got to direct today. <laughs> yeah, there's a stranger in a biker bar. And I was like, and he goes, what? I said, I've been trying to make movies since I was seven years old. And now I just directed a commercial type, but I had a real crew and real people really committed to trying to get their best in front of camera. They're excited to be there. Nobody wanted to leave, you know, like, unlike darkness, they wanted to leave after the first few days. But, uh, and, and the guy's like, that's crazy, man. That's awesome. I'm like, thanks, man. We go back to the table and uh, pictures of beer start coming over and there's total strangers buying our table pictures of beer, you know? So that was uh, life changing and working with these guys was a very similar Situation. I mean, it wasn't incredibly complex. Obviously, we're doing talking heads, but having a, a, a crew who knew what they were doing, who were excited to be there, who were happy to help out, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Did you have any difficulty tracking down all the different casting crew after 36 years? Um, it, it took a little doing, a little doing. Um, everybody was in it. Um, some were still in town. Uh, Susan Lyles, is Susan out uh, here? She's in Colorado now, and Barb. Schoenhofer couldn't be here tonight. She's going to be here for tomorrow for night screens, but uh, she was out in Colorado, I mean, California, and the director and the DP were. So we, we had a remote crew. The, the producer from England who, who brought me on, he and I put together the list of questions. And I, I talked to everybody a little bit beforehand. I told them what we were doing. Uh, but uh, then there was a few people who didn't want to be involved. Their lives had changed. Um, you know, and that happens. Um, I'll tell you some trivia that almost nobody knows about. A movie that influenced me, Evil Dead, the original Evil Dead. Uh, they did a demo film called Within the Woods. It was a proof of concept. It was 20 minutes long, cost $2,500, shot on Super 8 film. So after Dillis and other people told me you can't make a movie in Wichita, Dillis said you can't make a movie for $100,000, um, I, I was inspired also by Within the Woods. I knew that Sam Raimi and company had made this short film, shown it to investors, and raised the budget to make their movie. And so that's why I decided I was going to do with Artemis. Well, one thing, a few years ago, Within the Woods was supposed to finally come out on video. It's about, you get know, on bootlegs, you look on, on YouTube, there's some terrible, terrible, multiple generation VHS to VHS to VHS to VHS. And they're going to do a remaster and actually put it out. They actually paid money for music rights from like on Her Majesty's Secret Service and other stuff. They're going to do it. And then and it's going to come out in the Book of the Dead from Anchor Bay Video. Does anybody familiar with this? The uh, Evil Dead coming out in the big Book of the Dead? No, just me? Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah, you know. Uh, so anyway, and then suddenly, boom, they said, oh, within the woods has been pulled, it's not going to happen. And they came up with this BS excuse that Sam Raimi's like, well, it was my early days, I don't want people to see what I was doing. That's all malarkey, because I got from the inside word from that, that there's Bruce Campbell in Within the Woods and Alan Sandwich were in, in Within the Woods, and they were happy to be in it. The third person who was in it had moved on and was a mom and uh, uh, a big member of her church and other stuff, so she requested that they not release it. So that does happen. We had a few holdouts that didn't want to be involved for different reasons, but generally uh, we, got, we got the best people, so that's all I that matter. Does anyone have any questions from the audience? Not at yeah. all. Right there. Speaking of what happened with Toby Smith, was that the name, the writer, the journalist from the Eagle? Tony Brown. Tony Brown, okay. I looked for him. Yeah. And I even talked to some people at the Eagle, and, and nobody knew who he was, and they couldn't help me. Because I thought he'd be perfect. Yeah. Uh, but no, we couldn't track him down. Of course, he's probably sitting. Tony, are you here? Uh -huh. <laughs> Which version are we going to show tomorrow? We are showing the final cut. Now, if you buy the 4K Blu-ray, which is pretty expensive, like 35 bucks or something, you're going to have four discs. You're going to have a 4K version, you're going to have a Blu-ray of the movie, or maybe it's three discs, and then another Blu-ray that has what they call the pre-release cut. For whatever reason, they didn't want to give us the very final cut. What we're watching, the first time anybody in the world will have seen it, is as it's me consulting the director and Dillis Hart and Richard Caliendo, I don't know where Richard is, but... Uh, uh, and, and got their input. Oh, there's Richard. Raise your hand, Richard. Richard was the executive producer. You just watched up here. And I got their input, and we went through the movie and did the final cut. It's a little short. The things about. I think with the, it, we also have some intros. Uh, Alan Plone, the director, uh, did, recorded one for us, and we have uh, the, Ewan Kent, the British uh, filmmaker and video re release distributor producer. He did an introduction for it. But all together, it's like 75 to 80 minutes, somewhere in there, with with the introductions. Uh, but it, it's actually a really tight film, and, uh, and uh, hand to crime, it's a better movie, 
And it's, it's really watchable. I think you're all going to have a good time watching it. Oh, but spoil also, I wanted to give you a spoiler warning. Don't watch the documentary Blood and Chopsticks if you haven't seen Night Screams yet, because it will give away a lot of secrets and a lot of things. Oh, oh is that a little lady? Sorry, guys. Yeah, I was here watching it going, there are some people in here who have never even heard of Night Screams. And, uh, the, and we're actually talking about the very last shot of the movie. I'm like, sorry, folks. Uh, I, I had shown this to Melody, Melody first. And she really liked it. She said, you know, it really made me want to watch Night Screams. And she had talked to people, and nobody had heard of Night Screams. So she said, well, we do a few screenings of blood, blood, you know, blood and chopsticks. It might stimulate interest in, in the feature. So we're like, cool. So we're gonna, we did one at the, the, the micro cinema. And we're going to do more. And then the movie that was supposed to show tonight, for whatever reason, pulled out. And so she goes, you know, we have this opening. Would you want to show it at Tallgrass? I'm like, well, we're going to show the documentary the night before we show the feature, but yeah, if you want to. So that's why we had to mix up with the films and everything else. They were still on the old schedule, but uh, it worked out. I mean, I, I really appreciate you all coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, are we ready for? Yeah. We are ready to go. Nathan helped me on, on Blood Chopsticks. Where you hand, Nathan? He used his camera on it. So um, anyway. Yeah. Fritz, do you want to introduce your film? What's that? You want to see it? All right, we're going to watch Rich's movies, the world sorts of things and, um, and and interested in that but when I started buying a bunch of Bolexes I wanted to make a sound film and Bolexes originally weren't made for that so I had to have somebody manufacture a crystal sink thing so we could actually do sound with the Bolex so then I thought I need to make a noir Was there a specific noir that you felt influenced by? Well, not originally. In fact, I didn't know that much about it, so I got online and looked up the 10 best noir films, and I bought about five of them and watched them. So I became more familiar with them. Of course, I've seen some of them already, but it really influenced the original script. And the nice thing is, you know, you uh, co-wrote it with Roy, and he's yes. very uh, familiar Roy's, with a lot of Roy's films. Say hi. Okay. Roy's read about every dime crime novel that's ever been written <laughs> and added to the dialogue ones especially. I'd written the out, the major part of the movie he came in, wrote the dialogue, and then we rewrote it a lot too. Yeah, the dialogue did feel very authentic to the ears, so that's always nice to see. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the location? That's going to drive me nuts, because I swear I've seen that building before. Yes. Can you talk about that and the set design? Because everything looked fantastic. Well. Go ahead. No, you know. Um, Janie, Steve, Wayne, they own that beautiful house. And um, I met them through Rice's 
wife. It's been in Maria's been to a party and met on them. And uh, they and I, then I met with JD and Steve, and they were just really gracious and talked to them about what the movie was about. And they hopefully trusted me that it wasn't some quack. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they allowed to do that. And then we wanted everything to be authentic. So that automobile that drove up to the front was a 1931 Rio Real um, uh, given to it, uh, lent to us by Dave Marshall, who owns that car. And he actually was driving it. Yeah. We wouldn't touch it. Um, <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> and then we, our costuming was very important to us to be authentic. Gina, hi Gina, everybody say Gina. Um, did all the costuming and uh, spent a lot of time trying to make very authentic uh, costumes. Mm -hmm. Is that the pictures I saw at the film fest that we were at? Bob Side, question. Okay, yes. Yeah, I think so. Probably. Sorry, but I saw yeah. a preview of yeah, this did a speech almost about a year ago, yeah. Costuming. Yeah, yeah that's that. from this, yeah. It's funny to see things come full circle, <laughs> right? Uh, we talked a little bit before, and you mentioned the collaborative process with this. Can you talk a little bit oh, about that? Tyler talked about okay. that. Sure. Uh, so Fritz and I have worked together for a very long time, and uh, you know, I'm I'm very thankful to have. He's been a producer on on many of uh, my studio's films, and uh, I'm always happy to repay the favor in any way by working on his. And uh, this is probably the ultimate culmination of that uh, because I know he's also worked with Shattered Glass quite a bit, and uh, I had never worked with Nathan uh, up to that point. He's around, there's this area, yeah, there he is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember it was really funny because Fritz was convinced that we were not going to get along. <laughs> and uh, we worked together a couple times since and uh, is uh, definitely one of uh, the best cinematographers I've ever worked with. I kind of just, my approach was to uh, completely stay out of his way and just trust him. Uh, and that worked out as, as we can see. Um, but then, you know, there were uh, obviously our friends from Kansas City, Patrick Poe and Lola Loren are in there from IX Productions. Uh, and, um, you know, we wormed as much of my team in as we could. Uh, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was great to work with everybody. It was really cool. And that collaboration has kept going. Um, there are other productions that are going on right now and that have finished too that have used some of the same people. It's like Leaf mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we work real well together as, as different groups and as a big group. I think we have time for uh, audience question if anyone has any. Come on, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Did you guys shoot on black and white film stock or was it covered in? This was shot on black and white film, Kodak uh, Double X, whatever. Um, it's a uh, 400 foot reel on a, on a uh, Bolex EBM. Uh, so one of the later Bolexes made in the 1970s. So we were working on equipment that's 60 years old. And you have to be very careful of that. And this might be one interesting thing in that we did all our, let's say warm up shots or our rehearsal shots that you might do in video when you shoot lots and lots of takes. Uh, film was so expensive that we didn't want to take a lot of takes. So all our rehearsal shots, if you want to call them, were shot on video. Um, that was also backup in case we had equipment failures. Um, because that happens when you've got really old equipment. And, uh, and it turned out great. I just, I'm thrilled with the, with the resolution. It was scanned in 4K. Um, we spent some extra money on that too. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the music. Here's the guy that wrote the music. <laughs> Produced it too. Yes. Uh, other questions? The uh, staircase scene. I'm getting a hint of paying tribute to Hitchcock in that one. Yes. All right. Well, and also an opportunity, yeah. because when you look at that beautiful staircase and you walk into that room, it's one of the first things you see. And you see it goes up three flights. Mm -hmm. And anybody like me is thinking about shooting down. We, yeah, no, the second we walked into the house, I think both 
Nathan and I immediately thought, well, we got to go up there and see what it looks like. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking more than one of the scenes, she's coming down the small stairs, oh, yeah. and you're looking uh, kind of reminiscent of the big staircase at the, uh, at the Bates house. Right. Uh, that, that house, by the way, it's on Emporium, right? Yeah, I, I live in that. I'm a Riverside, so I'm interested in all the old houses and mansions of, you know, what's around Wichita State, that whole area, which fascinates me. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. What are you working on next, Chris? What? What are you going to do next? What are you working on oh, next? Everybody wants to know what I'm going to do next. <laughs> well, I, I'm shifting gears. I, I am going to help other people do a lot of films like I've been doing. I really enjoy that. And lately, I've done something that I had never done before. Acting, actually acted some bit parts. The first one I did a horrible job, but I don't know. I, 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 I hope it turns out modern. <laughs> um, the next one was okay. I felt more comfortable on the second one. You did excellent. Okay. Um, so I'd like to do some of that and be involved with other people's films. Um, I'm not young. Uh, making some of these films was a lot of work. They, they didn't move everything anyway, but um, I'm starting to venture off into experimental films uh, where I do a lot of the work myself or with a very small crew. And uh, some of it will be, again, with film cameras and some home. I've got uh, an idea of a collection of films, maybe five or six films will be shown together. That's my next task. What about yourself? Uh, too much. Um, <laughs> we're shooting a feature right now. Uh, not at this very moment, but <laughs> welcome, you're all in now. Uh, but yeah, the, the last couple months we've been shooting a feature. I'm about to, as soon as that one's done, start working on my second animated feature. And uh, that'll be a nightmare, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I'm, for, I'm keeping busy. And uh, if this guy ever wants me to help on his experimental ones, uh, I certainly will. Hey, thank you. <laughs> and, and by the way, he, this man did the first full-length animated film, Kansas, that we know of. 